Dr. Mark Goodacre, Francis Hill Fox Professor at Duke University. Is it of religious studies? Yes. Is it? Okay, I just want to make sure I yeah. added the little yeah, uh, yeah. cherry on the top. <laughs> yeah. And we do like talking about religious studies because one of the things that happens in a religious studies department like the one that I'm in is that nobody coming to class is expected to share what their kind of particular faith perspective is. So people come from all faith perspectives and none. And the thing about a religious studies context, rather than say a theological context or something like that is, we're not training ministers, we're just training people to think and to think critically and to explore the, the work. So, so we do kind of like that term religious studies because uh, it, it distinguishes us. Not that there's anything wrong with people that study, some of my best friends are theologians, but right. it makes we're a little bit different from, from them. And I, I like that, give, give people an opportunity to kind of explore it without worrying about potential theological implications. Mm -hmm. right. It's like, you can go into this, you can leave, right. you don't feel that there's pressure in any way, because that can sometimes happen, especially right. when you get to fundamentalist, of course, right. and I don't yeah, say yeah. Your, your friends are not, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that. Yeah. Um, evangelical maybe, but mm. you guys are obviously more technical. The question I'd like to ask, and it's more like um, if you could take us on a trip, mm -hmm. A chronological trip. I think too often, and I am guilty of this oh so often, and it's like we were raised this way in church. We start with uh, Matthew even. Mm -hmm. we, we don't even go to Mark. Mm -hmm. um, I have a really good friend also, by the way. He'd love to debate you on this topic. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're always wanting, to, people want you to debate him. Um, can you take us on a chronological airplane journey mm -hmm. on the New Testament that we have, like the evidence that we have, not only of the the character and you know Paul, his literature going into the Gospels, and then of course later on what we have, but maybe even mm -hmm. fill in a little detail, give a little furniture, and mm -hmm. say what is actually happening in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. What is this? If I could use the term story, even though they're multiple books mm -hmm. and they oftentimes don't line up, they're mm -hmm. not meant to be in agreement technically in many ways. What is the story of the New Testament? Well, I suppose we do tend to read canonically you know we read in order and I, I must admit whenever i'm teaching introduction to the new testament which I, I like to do every couple of years or so i find it really difficult to know where to start because there is that deep pull from our culture and from upbringing and all the rest of it which says you begin with the gospels right you always begin and, and of course even though the gospels are written later than paul they're still dealing with events earlier than Paul. So should you begin with the, you know, with the Gospels or should you begin with Paul? And I go round and round on this one. And sometimes I begin one way, sometimes I do it the other way. But if you wanted to look at the chronology in terms of what came first, in terms of writings, not the characters in them or whatever, then you will always begin with Paul. And probably if anybody wants to sort of begin reading the New Testament for the first time, great way to start is read 1 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians, we call it in American English. <laughs> so 1 Thessalonians, probably written as early as the 40s of the first century. This is within a generation of, of the death of Jesus, right? And you get there a real sense of what it was like being one of these early Jesus followers, because Paul is having to tell the Thessalonians all about what's going to happen when they die, because people have started dying. And they, they, they seem to be worrying about people dying because Jesus hasn't come back yet, right? So Paul has this sort of reassurance, and, and you get that real sense of urgency. And uh, you know, so, so I think beginning with 1 Thessalonians is, is a fantastic way to, to start. And you can work on through this. If you read 1 Corinthians, which I think is also pretty early, I think probably as early as like the early 50s, within 20 years or so of Jesus's, um, of Jesus's crucifixion, 1 Corinthians is full of interesting details about the earliest Christian communities. Paul talks about people's households and they're clearly not meeting. See, when we say church, we imagine building, big ornate fancy building usually, right? Right. When Paul's saying church, he means people gathering together in a house. Not a synagogue. Right, yeah, right, right. right. Interesting. So you've, got, so you've got this going on. I mean, I mean, and Paul even talks, he gives names of some of these people. Chloe's people, he mentions at one stage. and, and so you read through that and you get, and he's, and Paul's having to sort of legislate on the fly as well, because you've got people saying, well, are we allowed to divorce or not? Are we allowed, am I allowed to take my Christian brother to court or not? 
And so Paul is actually legislating on the fly. He's basically, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Because, you know, he can't, he hasn't always got a saying of Jesus for everything. And occasionally he does have. He says, like, when it comes to divorce and remarriage, he says, okay, this is what the Lord said. But with other stuff, he has to go, okay, well, this is what I think. And I think I've got the spirit of God. So, you know, you should be doing what I'm saying. You know, so he's really, and again, you get that rawness and that earliness. So it's right. very exciting to read that. And then you can carry on working through Paul's letters like that and end with Romans, because Romans is the most complicated. Yes. <laughs> and dense theologically and all the rest of it. And then you want to go from there and, and then read Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel, I think, is written in the early 70s, somewhere around there. It's after the big Jewish war with, um, with Rome. It's after the fall of Jerusalem. I think Mark is kind of influenced by Paul and by the Pauline movement, but it's now telling the story of Jesus. And reading Mark's gospel, again, a bit of rawness, a bit of kind of, you know, there's, there's a sort of, there's a, almost like a brutish genius to Mark, because it's written in this rough and ready style, like, immediately this and immediately that, then this, then this, then this, you know, all, all sort of like breathless. Sometimes he doesn't even finish his sentences, you know. There's a lovely bit in the story where Jesus is healing, healing the paralyzed man. And Jesus says, in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then that's it. Doesn't, doesn't finish the sentence, just stops. And then Mark goes on, he says to the paralyzed man, you know, it's like, hold on a minute, you were just talking then, you know. So, you, so you have this fantastic, you know, kind of rawness there. But there's a sort of literary genius about Mark as well. It's a beautifully crafted book, beautifully crafted book, right. fantastically structured. And Mark, I think, gives birth to Matthew because Matthew likes Mark, but is dissatisfied with it. Gives birth to Luke because Luke is dissatisfied and wants to improve it. And, and so, so, so that's, if you wanted to go chronologically, right. that's how I would go. I would go 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, <laughs> then um, work through some of the rest of Paul, then hit the Gospels, but go Mark first, then Matthew, then Luke, then John. That's, that's, how, I would, that's right. how I would do it. And would you say some of the pastorals and stuff kind of fall into the gaps between some of the, or would you say like between Luke and, and John? Do you know what? I have never really, confession time, I've never really enjoyed the pastoral epistles. I, I remember when I was doing my, I did an MPhil in between my my first degree and my doctorate. And as part of the MPhil, we had to translate the whole of the New Testament, just, just sort of work through, and then you could be examined on any bit of it. Oh, I remember getting to the pastorals and feeling so, <laughs> just kind of, when is this gonna end? I, I mean, it sounds, it's an awful thing to say, I know, and some people were be, be scandalized by, by my saying this, but, I find it, I, I don't find them very exciting myself, you know, right. to study. I realize that other people have found them exciting. I think also I find some of what it says about, uh, about women um, very difficult to read and so mm -hmm. on. So, yeah, but I think they're later. I don't think that they're written by Paul. I think that they could be as late as the early second century. I appreciate that. So then um, the question, I guess, would you say in light of this, and, and I try to give a chronology, right? But we're going to be talking in a sense about fundamentalist approaches mm -hmm. to this. Right. <clears throat> you clearly, uh, being a scholar, see multiple messages. Mm -hmm. It's not a single cohesive mm -hmm. one message. I'd even argue one gospel, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, where do you stand on the whole Paul and James and Peter thing? Right. At least early on. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't know if you believe the harmonization is accurate later in Acts, but are they friends? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one for well, you. Well, the, I mean, one way of looking at these things, new religious movements are often born out of conflict, right? Yes. Because you have one key character that says it was like this, and then somebody else comes and goes, nah, I think it's like this, right? And then in the debate between those things you get the formulation of ideas and theology is born out of that conflict and christianity if we can say christianity isn't any different from that i mean in the earliest period we're not really talking about christianity as a religion we're talking about a group of jewish followers of jesus who thought he was the messiah and so on but what happens is i think that paul has these really really difficult debates with people like peter and James, Jesus' brother. And out of those debates, a lot of his theology is formed. I mean, that's clear. You read the epistle to the Galatians. He's in a proper, serious argument there about whether or not Gentile 
Christians, Gentile converts to the Jesus movement, should be circumcised or not, the males, right? Should right. they be circumcised or not? And Paul is adamant that they should not, and it's very clear that other people thought that they should. And so out of that conflict is born this, this fascinating uh, theology that Paul has all about being justified by faith, being made righteous by faith, this, this, this sort of thing comes out of that, out of that difficult debate. Paul and Peter, though, who knows whether they ever actually made up. It's clear in Galatians 2 that there was a stand-up row between Paul and Peter in Antioch. Absolute stand-up row. Paul calls Peter a hypocrite, right? Now, you know, I'm lucky. I've never had a stand-up row in public with anybody where they call me a hypocrite. <laughs> but if it ever happens, it's going to take me a little while to get over that. Yeah. Did Peter ever get over that? We don't know. Yeah. I mean, in Acts of the Apostles, we have... We, we, we do have a, a thing, Acts 15 seems to tell a similar story to Galatians 2, but it's much more of a harmonious, happy kind of story. There's, there's, there's links with the story, but it's a much happier kind of story. So, but even in Acts, you never see Peter after Acts 15, he's gone. Yeah. He's gone, he vanishes from the story. I mean, Luke, has Luke just written him out of the story at this point? So it's, it's a tough one. I, I, I suspect that they never really fully made up, you know, after that. You know? Wow. I mean, there's, there's this extraordinary line. I think it's a line of real pathos in Galatians 2 where Paul says, even Barnabas was led astray by the hypocrisy, you know. And Barnabas, his good friend, that he's, he's been, you know, suffering with and he's been in prison with and he's been having a hard time with and all the rest of it. His best mate, Barnabas, even he seeds over to the other side, to Peter's side. And you know, you don't hear about Barnabas again in Paul's letters. He's gone. After Galatians 2, Barnabas is gone, right? So I think that that split, that divide was, 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 was serious. Now, when you get to the epistle to the Romans, which Paul writes later, Paul is in a much more ironic, peaceful kind of mode. And although Peter's not mentioned there and Barnabas isn't mentioned there as well, you can see him making overtures towards people that would have views more like, Peter's, Peter's view. Right. And you read Romans 16, which some people might think is the most boring chapter in Romans, which is the last chapter where it just has a whole bunch of names. And there you can see that Paul has got quite a lot of friends in Rome, in the early Christian movement, the emerging Christian movement. And he, he's working through lots of, the, lots of these kind of friendship networks to try and say, I'm not, you might have heard these terrible things about me, but actually I'm okay. Actually I'm okay. I am part of this this movement. Mm. You might have heard terrible things about me, but actually, don't worry, I I'm okay, you know, and, and, and hey, listen to the list of some of my friends, you know, I'm friends with Chris and Aquila, and I'm friends with Andronicus and Junior, and these people have been in the movement for years, you know, so that's really what he's doing there. So Paul does have that ironic side to him where he's trying to overture towards the side that previously was perhaps the one that was battling against him. Wow, my recent interview I did with uh, Steve <coughs> Mason was on the first generation of oh, Christians. Yeah, yeah. And we were talking about Paul, and this is amazing. He said it's like it's like <clears throat> overhearing a phone conversation, and you you hear the one yeah. side, and you get a taste. You know yeah. there's something going on. Yeah, yeah. Paul's trying to. It makes me wonder. Like, is James and Peter? And I'd say James and Peter as if they're individually mm -hmm. separate in their ideas. I don't know. I'm just I throw them together because mm -hmm. it's always Paul, Saul, only uh -huh. Peter, or Kephas, and James. And mm -hmm. I wonder if they were going around saying, "No, he's not one of us." Mm -hmm. Um, and we see the pseudo-Clementines seem to like mm -hmm. indicate this debate, which is fictitious, but nonetheless, it's like this debate between Peter right. saying, look, you, are you sure you didn't hear from a, a spirit, a devil, a right. demon, a right. ghost, or, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it, it's definitely the case that you've got, you've got some... Clement, you said something really interesting at the beginning, Chuck, but um, remind me... Um, about uh, Steve Mason <coughs> half conversations and the idea that oh, maybe yeah, they yeah. were going around saying yes. he's not one of us. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we do when we're reading Paul is is this mirror reading where you're actually trying to reconstruct the other side of the conversation, and it's exactly like that. It's like hearing. I, I remember being in Whole Foods once uh, in Durham, and I could hear somebody on having a really really serious phone call. Um, <laughs> And I assumed it was with, it was, it was a woman, I assumed she was talking to a boyfriend or a girlfriend that was in the process of breaking up with them while uh, over the phone in Whole Foods. And that's just me reconstructing it because of the kind of things that she was saying. Quite, it was kind of, I felt, 
was like this weird eavesdropping thing because I was on the other <laughs> side. But I was listening to that and, and later that day, I was teaching Paul. So I, I, I told my students this story, hoping that it wasn't one of my students. I don't think it was. I didn't recognize the voice. But I, I told them this story because it's listening to half of a conversation. But I could, I could put two and two together and work out what was going on in that conversation. That's really what it's like reading the epistle to the Galatians. You're reading half of a conversation. And that does make it difficult because then you've got to try and imagine what the other side's saying. Because Paul doesn't, isn't necessarily fair to the other side. Yeah. He, he, he might be, let's face it, whenever any of us have arguments, we put a spin on it, right? Oh, yeah. You know? And so Paul's clearly putting a spin on it. Like when he's telling the story about his big fight with Peter, we haven't got Peter's version of that story. Maybe Peter thought Paul was the one being a hypocrite, right? Right. So, so yes, absolutely. It's not just behind the pages of the New Testament you have conflict. It's on the pages of the New Testament. It's there loud and clear. We haven't got to kind of construct hypothetical conversations and things. They're there in, in, in the pages. It's very clear. I just wonder, I would love to find something that showed us the other side. Yeah, it was so yeah, fascinating. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? It you would. can get little hints of it in the sense that Matthew's Gospel, for example, does seem to try to rein in some of that rather gentle leaning Jesus of Mark's gospel. I mean, Mark's gospel is a bit strange in the sense that Jesus mainly comes into contact with fellow Jews, but every now and then he'll meet a, he'll, he'll, he'll meet a Gentile. And, and, and you can tell that Mark's trying to really big up this Jesus is, you know, is, is friendly to Gentiles, but Mark hasn't really got many stories to play with. And in fact, one of the stories, the Syrophoenician woman in, in Mark 7, He's actually quite, Jesus is actually quite rude to this woman. Right. It's not right to take, you know, the, the, the children's food and, and um, give it to the dogs. It's quite a rude thing to say, right? And, and the woman, of course, has this brilliant answer. Yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. So Mark is this kind of gentle leaning gospel. Just, and, and I assume that's because Mark is sympathetic to the Pauline mission, which is very kind of Gentile friendly. And I think then Matthew's pulling back a little bit on that. He wants to kind of say, look, what Matthew does is he re-Judaizes Mark's gospel in a way, brings it back towards the Judaism of Jesus. So even though Mark, I think, is late, even though so Matthew's later than Mark, it actually in some ways may be a more accurate sort of general picture of the historical Jesus. Like a pre more primitive aspect. Right, exactly. Not necessarily more sort of primitive traditions, but certainly he's trying to pull it back a little bit. So yes, we don't have the other side of the conversation in the sense we haven't got any materials directly from, say, Peter or from Jesus' brother James. But you do have texts like Matthew's Gospel, which seem to be trying to correct a little bit, you know, and then Luke comes along and, and of course he mediates I mean, I, I think Luke knows Matthew and Mark, so he mediates. So we've got Mark and Backbone, but then pulling in some of this kind of Jewish Jesus of Matthew. And, it, and it's Jewish Jesus and Mark as well, don't get me wrong. I mean, Mark is, is very clear. He, he, you know, he, he's not pretending, you know, Jesus is a Gentile, anything, no, no nonsense like that. But he, it, it, he's just leaning in towards the Gentile mission so much more. Makes a lot of sense. I just recently read Jesus and Paul, or Paul and Jesus, I'm sorry, by uh, James T uh, Tabor. Right, Professor Tabor. yes, yeah, my and, friend James uh, gonna, Tabor, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna be actually interviewing him sometime soon. Great, here. great, you'll but, enjoy that. Yeah, he takes a different stance on James than Dr. Uh, Ehrman, and uh -huh. uh, he <clears> thinks James is, it has some of this, what we're talking about with Matthew, like, yeah. well, why are you talking about the law? What, yeah. This sounds very, Jesus-y, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> not Paul-like. So. It yeah. seems like Jesus-y, and this friction I love. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah. it's amazing to hear this tension, and I think you're right. Like, um, It sounds like this is reflecting an earlier thing, but not as popular of a mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, who wants to circumcise right. if you're a pagan? Or if right. you're, and that brings us to one last question I'd like to ask you is, in this overview that you're taking us, this plane mm -hmm. that we're flying over the New Testament, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. there's something strange happening with Gentiles. Yeah. Sure, yeah, we have um, them like little here and there in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, where you find Ruth, you find uh, Esther, you find these mm -hmm. like, what? Or even like, mm -hmm. what's Jonah doing? He's right. running from God and yeah. he knows Nineveh is going to repent. If yeah. they do, God's going to show mercy to these, to these non-Israelites. Mm -hmm. 
Well, there are groups that I encounter, and sometimes there's even some radical groups like um, the British Israelites mm -hmm. or uh, Black Hebrew Israelites that mm -hmm. are having people kiss their feet in Brooklyn, New York. Like mm -hmm. really extremist groups that tend to say, we're the lost Israelites. Mm -hmm. This is going to open up a can of worms I don't want to open <laughs> yet, like maybe another, yeah. sh another video. But ultimately, are the Gentiles in the New Testament actual pagans? Mm -hmm. Because now we're bringing in Dr. Jason Staples right, some yeah, way, yeah. and this yeah, is yeah. like a yeah. whole another yeah, yeah. can of worms. So maybe just give us a tease on like what is the gen who are the Gentiles in the New Testament? It's I mean, it's it's it, this is such a fascinating question, uh, and to some extent, we don't know the answer because Paul will just use terms like Gentiles, which could just I mean, what, what does that actually what does that actually mean? I mean, it's even more complicated in the Greek insofar as the word which we translate Gentiles in Greek is, is the word ethnos and, and, and that basically also means nation. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about the nation. So sometimes when Paul is talking apparently about Gentiles, he might just mean the nations, right? Right. Which is also something you find you know, throughout the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible, you know. So that one's complicated. And one of the fascinating questions as well is where do God fearers fit into this? Because we know that there were people who were sympathetic with Judaism but did not fully convert to Judaism and we generally give them that term God-fearers and one great question there is were these people worshipping other gods? It, did they think that the God of Israel was somehow kind of better than other gods but that but there were still lots of other gods? They may well have done. Did they avoid having idols in their in their home? I mean that term idols is of course a deeply freighted term. I mean, I mean, it's a very disparaging term. They wouldn't have called them idols, you know. Right. But but would would you know? Are these are these people who are sympathetic to Judaism and who who may then have been sympathetic to the early Christian movement? Do they have what Christians and Jews called idols in their homes or or not? So, uh, and if one asks the question, were there some people who converted to the Jesus movement completely from you know, a pagan, again, very freighted term, yeah. background, definitely. It certainly would have been, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're not just talking, Paul is, for example, is not just going to the people who are hangers-on outside of the synagogue, you know, people standing <laughs> outside, and he's going, oh, tell you what, you know, let me tell you about, you know, I can tell you a way into this, I can tell you a way into this that isn't going to involve you having to be circle. I don't think that's what's, what's going on really at all. And let's face it, Paul is meeting who he's meeting when he's going about his business. So yes, his networks are sometimes a question of he, he arrives in a city and he, you know, he, we, he will surely be going to synagogue and meeting people, but he's also you know, doing whatever his work with his hands is. Luke says it was tent making, but Paul talks about working with his hands. So he's meeting people when he's doing that. And I don't think he's discriminating between those that he might have thought of as being pagans and those he might have thought as being kind of God-fearing uh, Gentiles. He's just talking to any and all of them. We right? have historical evidence, just the last point, is, is we have historical evidence by Philo and mm -hmm. others of God-fearers mm -hmm. being n not ethnic Israelites. We right. have no reason to conclude they're ethnically right. related. Right. or anything. No, right. So I think that just kind of is something very powerful because mm -hmm. there's some people who go full fiction. Yeah. Well, according to this story, and I can't even begin to elaborate mm -hmm. um, how non-academic this approach really is, mm -hmm. but they will they do that in order to have their theological biases met. Right, yeah. And so yeah. I just thought it'd be important to hear you say, yeah. God-fearers aren't ethnic Israelites right. that we're aware of in any way. Mm -hmm. So Right. I mean, the, the, what you may well have had in, in, I mean, we, we haven't got much evidence for this, but what you may well have had in the early Jesus movement are people who, you know, you know we like in our culture talk about sort of lapsed Catholics, for example, you know, right. someone who, you know, who is born Catholic, brought up Catholic, but is no longer going to mass, right, or to confession. Were there equivalent Jewish people in the first century? Surely, surely there would right. be people, people like that. But whether they're attracted to the Jesus movement in big numbers or not, we don't know. The Gospels kind of imply that there are people like that, on the, that, you know, that, that Jesus is, is, is attracting the marginalized. But it, the, the difficulty is that when you're doing storytelling, with the gospel, which the Gospels are doing, it always makes a much more interesting story if you're talking about someone from the margins coming in. If, like, you know, you don't get 
stories about, you know, kind of somebody who is, you know, this really faithful uh, Jewish person who, who's, you know, always going to synagogue, always giving, always giving, you know, money away and all the rest of it. And, oh yeah, and then, you know, and then they came and met Jesus and they sat down at dinner. I mean, it's just right. not a very interesting story. It's a much more interesting story if you, if you have a tax collector who, who repents, you know, because he was climbing up a tree and, you know, and because he was a bit short. I mean, it's a in, much more interesting story, right, right. isn't it? So the, the Gospels attract stories about the marginalized and it's difficult to know whether that's because Jesus historically was always 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 going out to the marginalized or whether it's just because they're some of the more interesting stories that get told right thank you appreciate it Dr. Goodegger